Act Three of Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. Scene One, London, Queen Catherine's apartments. Enter Queen Catherine and her women as at work. Take thy lute, wench. My soul grows sad with troubles. Sing and disperse em if thou canst. Leave working. Morpheus with his lute made trees, and the mountain tops that freeze bow themselves when he did sing. To his music, plants and flowers ever sprung as sun and showers that made a lasting spring. Everything that heard him play. Even the billows of the sea hung their heads and then lay by. In sweet music is such a chant, killing care and grief of heart, fall asleep or hearing die. Enter a gentleman. How now? And please, your grace, the two Greek cardinals wait in the presence. Would they speak with me? They will me say so, madam. Pray their graces to come near. Exit gentlemen. What can be their business with me? A poor weak woman fallen from favour. I do not like their coming. Now I think on it they should be good men, their affairs as righteous. But all hoods make not monks. Enter Cardinal Wolsey and Cardinal Compeius. Peace to your highness. Your graces find me here part of a housewife. I would be all against the worst may happen. What are your pleasures with me, reverend lords? May it please you, noble madam, to withdraw into your private chamber. We shall give you the full cause of our coming. Speak it here. There's nothing I have done yet that my conscience deserves a corner. Would all other women could speak this with as free a soul as I do. My lords, I care not so much I am happy above a number, if my actions were tried by every tongue, every eye saw em, envy and base opinion set against em, I know my life so even. If your business seek me out, and that way I am wife in, out with it boldly. Truth loves open dealing. Tenta est erga te mentis integritas, regina serenissima. Oh, good my lord, no Latin. I am not such a truant since my coming as not to know the language I have lived in. A strange tongue makes my cause more strange, suspicious. Pray speak in English. Here are some will thank you if you speak truth for their poor mistress' sake. Believe me, she has had much wrong. Lord Cardinal, the willingest sin I ever yet committed may be absolved in English. Noble lady, I am sorry my integrity should breed, and service to his majesty and you, so deep suspicion where all faith was meant. We come not by the way of accusation to taint that honour every good tongue blesses, nor to betray you any way to sorrow. You have too much, good lady but to know how you stand minded in the weighty difference between the king and you, and to deliver, like free and honest men, our just opinions and comforts to your cause. Most honoured madam, my lord of York, out of his noble nature, seal and obedience he still bore your grace, forgetting like a good man your late censor, both of his truth and him, which was too far, offers as I do, in a sign of peace, his service, and his counsel. Aside. To betray me. My lords, I thank you both for your good wills. Ye speak like honest men. Pray God ye prove so. But how to make ye suddenly an answer in such a point of weight so near mine honour, more near my life, I fear, with my weak wit, and to such men of gravity and learning, in truth I know not. I was set at work among my maids, full little, God knows, looking either for such men or such business. For her sake that I have been, for I feel the last fit of my greatness. Good your graces, let me have time and counsel for my cause. 
Alas, I am a woman, friendless, hopeless. Madam, you wrong the king's love with these fears. Your hopes and friends are infinite. In England but little for my profit. Can you think, lords, that any Englishman there give me counsel? Or be a known friend gainst his highness pleasure, though he be grown so desperate to be honest and live a subject? Nay, forsooth, my friends, they that must weigh out my afflictions, they that my trust must grow to, live not here. They are, as all my other comforts, far hence, in mine own country, lords. I would your grace would leave your griefs and take my counsel. How, sir? Put your main cause into the king's protection. He is loving and most gracious. It will be much both for your honour better and your cause. For if the trial of the law overtake ye, you will part away disgraced. He tells you rightly. Ye tell me what ye wish for both. My ruin. Is this your Christian counsel? Out upon ye! Heaven is above all, yet there sits a judge that no king can corrupt. Your rage mistakes us. The more shame for ye! Holy men, I thought ye! Upon my soul too reverent cardinal virtues! But cardinal sins and hollow hearts I fear ye! Mend them for shame, my lords! Is this your comfort? The cordial that ye bring a wretched lady, a woman lost among ye, laughed at, scorned? I will not wish ye half my miseries. I have more charity. But say I warned ye. Take heed for heaven's sake, take heed, lest at once the burden of my sorrows fall upon ye. Madam, this is a mere distraction. You turn the good we offer into envy. Ye turn me into nothing. Woe upon ye and all such false professors. Would you have me, if you have any justice, any pity, if ye be anything but churchmen's habits, put my sick cause into his hands that hates me? Alas, has banished me his bed already, his love too long ago. I am old, my lords, and all the fellowship I hold now with him is only my obedience. What can happen to me above this wretchedness? All your studies make me a curse like this. Your fears are worse. Have I lived thus long? Let me speak myself, since virtue finds no friends. A wife, a true one, a woman, I dare say, without vain glory, never yet branded with suspicion. Have I with all my full affection still met the king? loved him next heaven, obeyed him, been out of fondness superstitious to him, almost forgot my prayers to content him. And am I thus rewarded? Tis not well, lords. Bring me a constant woman to her husband, one that ne'er dreamed a joy beyond his pleasure, and to that woman when she has done most, yet will I add an honour, a great patience. Madam, you wander from the good we aim at. My lord, I dare not make myself so guilty to give up willingly that noble title your master wed me to. Nothing but death shall e'er divorce my dignities. Pray, hear me. Would I had never trod this English earth, or felt the flatteries that grow upon it. Ye have angels' faces, but heaven knows your hearts. What will become of me now, wretched lady? I am the most unhappy woman living. Alas, poor wenches, where are now your fortunes? Shipwrecked upon a kingdom where no pity, no friend, no hope, no kindred weep for me. Almost no grave allowed me. Like the lily that once was mistress of the field and flourished, I'll hang my head and perish. If your grace could but be brought to know our ends are honest, you'd feel more comfort. Why should we, good lady, upon what cause wrong you? Alas, our places, the way of our profession, is against it. We are to cure such sorrows, not to sow em. For goodness sake, consider what you do, how you may hurt yourself. 
I utterly grow from the king's acquaintance by this carriage. The hearts of princes kiss obedience, so much they love it, but to stubborn spirits they swell and grow as terrible as storms. I know you have a gentle, noble temper, a soul as even as a calm. Pray, think us those we profess, peacemakers, friends, and servants. Madam, you'll find it so. You wrong your virtues with these weak women's fears. A noble spirit as yours was put into you, ever cast such doubts as false coin from it. The king loves you. Beware you lose it not. For us, if you please to trust us in your business, we are ready to use our utmost studies in your service. Do what ye will, my lords, and pray forgive me if I have used myself unmannerly. You know I am a woman, lacking wit to make a seemly answer to such persons. Pray do my service to his majesty. He has my heart yet and shall have my prayers while I shall have my life. Come, reverend fathers, bestow your counsels on me. She now begs that little thought when she set footing here she should have bought her dignities so dear. Exeunt. Scene two. Antechamber to King Henry the Eighth's apartment. Enter Norfolk, Suffolk, Surrey, and Chamberlain. If you will now unite in your complaints and force them with a constancy, the cardinal cannot stand under them. If you omit the offer of this time, I cannot promise but that you shall sustain more new disgraces, with these you bear already. I am joyful to meet the least occasion that may give me remembrance of my father-in-law, the duke, to be revenged on him. Which of the peers have uncondemned gone by him, or at least strangely neglected? When did he regard the stamp of nobleness in any person out of himself? My lords, you speak your pleasures. What he deserves of you and me, I know. What we can do to him, though now the time gives way to us, I much fear. If you cannot bar his access to the king, never attempt anything on him, for he hath a witchcraft over the king in his tongue. Oh, fear him not, his spelling that is out. The king hath found matter against him, that for ever mars the honey of his language. No, he's settled, not to come off in his displeasure. Sir, I should be glad to hear such news as this once every hour. Believe it, this is true. In the divorce his contrary proceedings are all unfolded wherein he appears, as I would wish mine enemy. How came his practices to light? Most strangely. Oh, how, how? The cardinal's letters to the Pope miscarried, and came to the eye of the king, wherein was read how that the cardinal did entreat his holiness to stay the judgment of the divorce, for if it did take place, I do, quoth he, perceive my king is tangled in affection to a creature of the queen's, Lady Anne Boleyn. Has the king this? Believe it. Will this work? The king in this perceives him, how he coasts and hedges his own way. But in this point all his tricks founder, and he brings his physic after his patient's death. The king already hath married the fair lady. Would he had! May you be happy in your wish, my lord, for I profess you have it. Now all my joy trace the conjunction. My amen to it. All men's. There's order given for her coronation. Marry, this is yet but young, and may be left to some ears unrecounted. But, my lords, she is a gallant creature, and complete in mind and feature. I persuade me from her will fall some blessing to this land, which shall in it be memorized. But will the king digest this letter of the cardinals? The Lord forbid. Marry, amen. No, no, there be more wasps that buzz about his nose will make this sting the sooner. Cardinal Campeus has stolen away to Rome, hath taken no leave, has left the cause of the king unhandled, and is posted as the agent of our cardinal to second all his plot. I do assure you the king cried, Ha! at this. Now, 
God incense him, and let him cry, Ha! louder. But, my lord, when returns Cramner? He is returned in his opinions, which have satisfied the king for his divorce, together with all famous colleges almost in Christendom. Shortly, I believe, his second marriage shall be published, and her coronation. Catherine no more shall be called queen, but princess dowager, and widow to prince Arthur. This same Cranmer is a worthy fellow, and hath ta'en much pain in the king's business. He has, and we shall see him for it in archbishop. So I hear. Tis so. The cardinal. Enter Cardinal Wolsey and Cromwell. Observe, observe, he's moody. The packet, Cromwell, gave it you the king. To his own hand, in his bedchamber. Look he of the inside of the paper. Presently he did unseal them, and the first he viewed, he did it with a serious mind. A heed was in his countenance. You he bade attend him here this morning. Is he ready to come abroad? I think by this he is. Leave me a while. Exit Cromwell. Aside. It shall be to the Duchess of Alençon, the French king's sister. He shall marry her. Anne Bullen. No, I'll know Anne Bullen's for him. There's more in it than fair visage. Bullen. No, we'll know Bullen's. Speedily, I wish to hear from Rome. The Marchioness of Pembroke. He's discontented. Maybe he hears the king does wet his anger to him. Sharp enough, lord, for thy justice. Aside. The late queen's gentlewoman, a knight's daughter, to be her mistress' mistress, the queen's queen. This candle burns not clear. Tis I must snuff it, then out it goes. What though I know her virtuous and well-deserving, yet I know her for a spleeny Lutheran, and not wholesome to our cause, that she should lie o' the bosom of our hard-ruled king. Again there is sprung up an heretic, an arch-one, Cranmer, one hath crawled into the favour of the king, and is his oracle. He is vexed at something. I would twere something that would fret the string, the master cordon's heart. Enter King Henry the Eighth, reading of a schedule and Lavelle. The king, the king. What piles of wealth hath he accumulated to his own portion? And what expense by the hour seems to flow from him? How, in the name of thrift, does he rake this together? Now, my lords, saw you the cardinal? My lord, we have stood here observing him. Some strange commotion is in his brain. He bites his lip and starts, stops on a sudden, looks upon the ground, then lays his finger on his temple, straight springs out into a fast gait, then stops again, strikes his breast hard, and anon he casts his eye against the moon in most strange postures. We have seen him set himself. It may well be. There is a mutiny in his mind. This morning papers of state he sent me to peruse, as I required, and watch you what I found there, on my conscience put unwittingly. Forsooth, an inventory, thus importing the several parcels of his plate, his treasure, rich stuffs, and ornaments of household, which I find at such proud rate that it outspeaks possession of a subject. It's heaven's will. Some spirit put this paper in the packet to bless your eye with all. If we did think his contemplation were above the earth and fixed on spiritual object, he should still dwell in his musings. But I am afraid his thinkings are below the moon, not worth his serious considering. King Henry the Eighth takes his seat, whispers Lavelle, who goes to Cardinal Wolsey. Heaven forgive me. Ever God bless your highness. Good my lord. You are full of heavenly stuff, and bear the inventory of your best graces in your mind, the which you are now running o'er. You have scarce time to steal from spiritual leisure a brief span, to keep your earthly audit. Sure, in that I deem you an ill husband, and am glad to have you there in my companion. Sir, for holy offices I have a time, a time to think upon the part of business which I bear in the state, and nature does require her times of preservation, which perforce I, her frail son, amongst my brethren mortal, must give my tendance to. 
you have said well and ever may your highness yoke together as i will lend you cause my doing well with my well saying tis well said again and tis a kind of good deed to say well yet words are no deeds my father loved you he said he did and with his deed did crown his word upon you since i had my office i have kept you next my heart have not alone employed you where high profits might come home but paired my present havings to bestow my bounties upon you aside what should this mean aside the lord increase this business have i not made you the prime man of the state i pray you tell me if what i now pronounce you have found true and if you may confess it say withal if you are bound to us or no what say you my sovereign i confess your royal graces showered on me daily have been more than could my studied purposes requite which went beyond all man's endeavours my endeavours have ever come too short of my desires yet filed with my abilities mine own ends have been mine so that evermore they pointed to the good of your most sacred person and the profit of the state for your great graces heaped upon me poor undeserver i can nothing render but allegiant thanks my prayers to heaven for you my loyalty which ever has and ever shall be growing till death that winter kill it fairly answered a loyal and obedient subject is therein illustrated the honour of it does pay the act of it as in the contrary the foulness is the punishment i presume that as my hand has opened bounty to you my heart dropped love my power rained honour more on you than any so your hand and heart your brain and every function of your power should notwithstanding that your bond of duty as twere in love's particular be more to me your friend than any i do profess that for your highness good i ever laboured more than mine own that am have and will be though all the world should crack their duty to you and throw it from their soul though perils did abound as thick as thought could make em and appear in forms more horrid yet my duty as doth a rock against the chiding flood should the approach of this wild river break and stand unshaken yours tis nobly spoken take notice lords he has a loyal breast for you have seen him open it read o'er this giving him papers and after this and then to breakfast with what appetite you have exit king henry the eighth frowning upon cardinal wolsey the nobles throng after him, smiling and whispering. What should this mean? What sudden anger's this? How have I reaped it? He parted frowning from me, as if ruin leaped from his eyes. So looks the chafed lion upon the daring huntsman that has galled him, then makes him nothing. I must read this paper. I fear the story of his anger. Tis so this paper has undone me tis the account of all that world of wealth i have drawn together for mine own ends indeed to gain the popedom and fee my friends in rome o oh, negligence fit for a fool to fall by what cross devil made me put this main secret in the packet i sent the king is there no way to cure this no new device to beat this from his brains I know twill stir him strongly. Yet I know a way, if I take right, in spite of fortune, will bring me off again. What's this? To the Pope? The letter as I live with all the business I writ to his holiness. Nay, then, farewell. I have touched the highest point of all my greatness, and from that full meridian of my glory i haste now to my setting i shall fall like a bright exhalation in the evening and no man see me more re-enter to cardinal wolsey norfolk and suffolk surrey and the chamberlain 
Here the king's pleasure, cardinal, who commands you to render up the great seal presently into our hands, and to confine yourself to Asher House, my lord of Winchester's, till you hear further from his highness. Stay, where's your commission, lords? Words cannot carry authority so weighty. Who dare cross him, bearing the king's will from his mouth expressly? Till I find more than will or words to do it, I mean your malice, no, officious lords, I dare and must deny it. Now I feel of what coarse metal ye are moulded. Envy! How eagerly ye follow my disgraces as if it fed ye, and how sleek and wanton ye appear in everything may bring my ruin. Follow your envious courses, men of malice. You have Christian warrant for em, and no doubt in time will find their fit rewards. That seal you ask with such a violence, the king, mine and your master, with his own hand, gave me, bade me enjoy it with the place and honours during my life, and to confirm his goodness, tied it by letters patents. Now who will take it? The king that gave it. It must be himself, then. Thou art a proud traitor, priest. Proud lord, thou liest. Within these forty hours Surrey durst better have burnt that tongue than said so. Thy ambition, thou scarlet sin, robbed this bewailing land of noble Buckingham, my father-in-law. The heads of all thy brother cardinals, with thee and all thy best parts bound together, weighed not a hair of his. Plague of your policy! You sent me deputy for Ireland, far from his succour, from the king, from all that might have mercy on the fault thou gavest him, whilst your great goodness, out of holy pity, absolved him with an axe this and all else this talking lord can lay upon my credit i answer is most false the duke by law found his deserts how innocent i was from any private malice in his end his noble jury and foul cause can witness if i loved many words lord i should tell you you have as little honesty as honour that in the way of loyalty and truth toward the king, my ever royal master, dare mate a sounder man than Surrey can be, and all that love his follies. By my soul, your long coat priest protects you. Thou shouldst feel my sword, i' the life blood of thee else. My lords, can ye endure to hear this arrogance? And from this fellow, if we live thus tamely, to be thus jaded by a piece of scarlet, farewell nobility. Let his grace go forward and dare us with his cap like larks. All goodness is poison to thy stomach. Yes, that goodness of gleaning all the land's wealth into one, into your own hands, cardinal, by extortion. The goodness of your intercepted packets you writ to the Pope against the king. Your goodness, since you provoke me, shall be most notorious. My lord of Norfolk, as you are truly noble, as you respect the common good, the state of our despised nobility, our issues, who, if he live, will scarce be gentlemen, produce the grand sum of his sins, the articles collected from his life. I'll startle you worse than the scaring bell when the brown wench lay kissing in your arms, lord cardinal." How much methinks I could despise this man, but that I am bound in charity against it. Those articles, my lord, are in the king's hand, but thus much they are foul ones. So much fairer and spotless shall mine innocence arise when the king knows my truth. This cannot save you. I thank my memory, I yet remember some of these articles, and out they shall. Now if you can blush and cry guilty, cardinal, you'll show a little honesty. Speak on, sir, I dare your worst objections. If I blush, it is to see a nobleman want manners. I had rather want those than my head. Have at you. First, that, without the king's assent or knowledge, you wrought to be a legate, by which power you maimed the jurisdiction of all bishops. Then that in all you writ to Rome, or else to foreign princes, ergo et rex meus, was still inscribed, in which you brought the king to be your servant. Then that, without the knowledge either of king or council, when you went ambassador to the emperor, you made bold to carry into Flanders the great seal. 
Item, you sent a large commission to Gregory de Casado to conclude, without the king's will or the state's allowance, a league between his highness and Ferrara. That, out of mere ambition, you have caused your holy hat to be stamped on the king's coin. Then that you have sent innumerable substance, by what means got I leave to your own conscience, to furnish Rome and to prepare the ways you have for dignities, to the mere undoing of all the kingdom. Many more there are, which, since they are of you and odious, I will not taint my mouth with. O oh, my lord, press not a falling man too far. Tis virtue. His faults lie open to the laws. Let them, not you, correct him. My heart weeps to see him so little of his great self. I forgive him. Lord Cardinal, the king's further pleasure is, because all those things you have done of late by your power legatine, within this kingdom fall into the compass of a premunir, that therefore such a writ be sued against you, to forfeit all your goods, lands, tenements, chattels, and whatsoever, and to be out of the king's protection. This is my charge. And so we'll leave you to your meditations, how to live better. For your stubborn answer about the giving back the great seal to us, the king shall know it, and no doubt shall thank you. So fare you well, my little good Lord Cardinal. Exunt all but Cardinal Wolsey. So farewell to the little good you bear me. Farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. This is the state of man. To-day he puts forth the tender leaves of hopes. To-morrow blossoms and bears his blushing honours thick upon him. The third day comes a frost, a killing frost. And when he thinks, good easy man, full surely his greatness is a ripening, nips his root, and then he falls, as I do. I have ventured, like little wanton boys that swim on bladders, this many summers in a sea of glory, but far beyond my depth. My high-blown pride at length broke under me, and now has left me weary and old with service, to the mercy of a rude stream that must for ever hide me. Vain pomp and glory of this world, I hate ye. I feel my heart new opened. Oh, how wretched is that poor man that hangs on princes' favours! There is, betwixt that smile we would aspire to, that sweet aspect of princes, and their ruin more pangs and fears than wars or women have. And when he falls, he falls like Lucifer, never to hope again. Enter Cromwell, and stands amazed. Why, how now, Cromwell? I have no power to speak, sir. What, amazed at my misfortunes? Can thy spirit wonder a great man should decline? Nay, and you weep, I am fallen indeed. How does your grace? Why, well, never so truly happy, my good Cromwell. I know myself now and I feel within me a peace above all earthly dignities, a still and quiet conscience. The king has cured me, I humbly thank his grace, and from these shoulders, these ruined pillars, out of pity, taken a load would sink a navy, too much honour. Oh, tis a burthen, Cromwell, tis a burthen too heavy for a man that hopes for heaven, I am glad your grace has made that right use of it. I hope I have. I am able now, methinks, out of a fortitude of soul I feel, to endure more miseries and greater far than my weak-hearted enemies dare offer. What news abroad? The heaviest and the worst is your displeasure with the king. God bless him. The next is that Sir Thomas More is chosen Lord Chancellor in your place. That's somewhat sudden, but he's a learned man. May he continue long in his highness' favour, and do justice for truth's sake and his conscience, that his bones, when he has run his course and sleeps in blessings, 
may have a tomb of orphans' tears wept on him. What more? That Cranmer is returned with welcome, installed Lord Archbishop of Canterbury. That's news indeed. Last, that the Lady Anne, whom the king hath in secrecy long married, this day was viewed in open as his queen, going to chapel, and the voice is now only about her coronation. There was the weight that pulled me down. O oh, Cromwell, the king has gone beyond me. All my glories in that one woman I have lost for ever. No son shall ever usher forth mine honors, or gild again the noble troops that waited upon my smiles. Go, get thee from me, Cromwell. I am a poor fallen man, unworthy now to be thy lord and master. Seek the king. That son, I pray, may never set. I have told him what and how true thou art. He will advance thee. Some little memory of me will stir him. I know his noble nature, not to let thy hopeful service perish too. Good Cromwell, neglect him not. Make use now and provide for thine own future safety. O oh Lord, must then I leave you? Must I needs forego so good, so noble, and so true a master? Bear witness, all that have not hearts of iron, with what a sorrow Cromwell leaves his lord. The king shall have my service, but my prayers for ever and for ever shall be yours. Cromwell, I did not think to shed a tear in all my miseries, but thou hast forced me out of thy honest truth to play the woman. Let's dry our eyes, and thus far hear me, Cromwell, and when I am forgotten, as I shall be, and sleep in dull, cold marble, where no mention of me more must be heard of, say, I taught thee. Say, Wolsey, that once trod the ways of glory, and sounded all the depths and shoals of honor, found thee a way out of his wreck to rise in, a sure and safe one, though thy master missed it. Mark but my fall, and that that ruined me, Cromwell, I charge thee, fling away ambition. By that sin fell the angels. How can man, then, the image of his maker, hope to win by it? Love thyself last. Cherish those hearts that hate thee. Corruption wins not more than honesty. Still in thy right hand carry gentle peace to silence envious tongues. Be just and fear not. Let all the ends thou aimest at be thy countries, thy gods, and truths. Then if thou fallest, O Cromwell, thou fallest a blessed martyr. Serve the king, and, prithee, lead me in, there take an inventory of all I have to the last penny. Tis the king's. My robe and my integrity to heaven is all I dare now call mine own. O oh, Cromwell, Cromwell, had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies. Good sir, have patience. So I have. Farewell the hopes of court, my hopes in heaven do dwell. Exeunt. End of Act Three.